On behalf of the Global Institute for Water Security and the Global Water Futures Project, I want to welcome all of you to this, our 10th season of the Distinguished Lecture Series. Hard to believe this is <laughs> our 10th season. Uh, I'd like to welcome the 990 students from the Masters of Water Security Program and both our online and in-person guests today. It's just terrific to have a, a group live together in Saskatoon. And of course, we welcome all the folks uh, online, including Jessica and myself. I first want to acknowledge that we're, we're coming to you today from Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. And we pay our respects to these First Nations and our Métis ancestors of this place as we at the Global Institute for Water Security uh, reaffirm our relationship with one another. Uh, don't forget next week, we have Josh Larson coming to us from University of Birmingham in the UK. And he'll be talking about forests, snow and ecosystem engineering. So that will be an interesting seminar to watch out for. Don't forget too, that we will be uh, having an early career discussion with each of the speakers immediately following their uh, talks. And Kim will put that separate Zoom address into the chat. So if those online want to join, please do. That will be from 11 till noon Saskatoon time. And for those live, we'll be doing it uh, in the GIWS conference room. So please mosey on over there, bring some of the coffee and cookies that you have in the room. So today with uh, no further ado, I want to uh, welcome uh, warmly uh, Jessica Lundquist. Uh, Jessica is coming to us today from the University of Washington, where she is the uh, Sylvester Endowed Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. She's been there, I think, since about 2006. Prior to that, she did her PhD at the Scripps Institution for, of Oceanography at uh, University of California, San Diego. Uh, Jessica has made some very deep impacts in our understanding of uh, snow accumulation, uh, patterns of accumulation, melt and stream flow, particularly in complex terrain. And you'll be hearing about that today. So we're very lucky to have uh, such an international thought leader with us. Uh, she's been recognized for this work with many accolades. Uh, one, she's been a recently, I think, a visiting professor at WSL in Zurich. Uh, she's won several awards for her publications, including an Editor's Choice Award from uh, Water Resources Research our top water journal. Um, she ha has won a chair's award for excellence and mentoring of doctoral students. And I, I'm excited to uh, again, welcome her to the mentoring session after this talk where we'll draw upon some of those uh, experiences and accolades. And lastly, uh, of, of the few that I'm referring to here, uh, she was a Cryosphere Young Investigator uh, Awardee from AGU. So uh, without further ado, Jessica, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, I will now mute and look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff, for the excellent introduction. And thank you for inviting me to lead off your seminar series. Um, today, I'm gonna to be talking about some recent work I've been doing. So I have questions for you. Um, this is not a summary of everything I've already done and published. This is what I've been working on most recently and I need feedback. So I have some questions in the middle and I look forward for lots of questions at the end. And if a slide does not make sense, that's fair too. You can say, please explain it because um, I, I haven't presented this um, live before. So um, brand new research. And this is a photo from um, Ryan Courier's time-lapse camera in the East River watershed showing um, two moose <laughs> hanging out by his snow poles here. Uh, they knocked one over in the next photo. And this is early season snow on December 1st. And what brings me to this is a wildlife study where we're asking about um, the importance of early season snow, what happens in the fall and how does that predict what happens the rest of the year. Um, before I jump into, um, this talk, I just want to acknowledge all the people in my mountain hydrology research group. Um, I won't be talking about any of these things, but if there's anything on here that looks interesting, feel free to ask me in the question section afterwards that I can put you in touch with any of these um, brilliant people who are doing lots of other cool snow research right now. Um, moving, moving forward, um, I was at a, a NASA workshop a while ago and um, 
Jared Enton with Lady at East said, okay, I don't want any of the professors to write why we should study snow. I want to ask all the grad students. The grad students should write why we should study snow. I said, well, why, why do you want the grad students and not the professors? I said, because the, the professors don't even know why they study snow. And I said, well, then why should we ask the grad student? Let's just ask our kids. And so if you ask our kids, um, this is one of my fa kids' favorite books um, by Roy McKee and P.D. Eastman. And they say, I want to know if you like snow. Do you like it? Yes or no? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I do like snow. What makes it snow? We do not know. But snow is fun to dig and throw. And really, in all honesty, most field snow scientists really just like to dig in the snow. It's <laughs> probably why we're studying the snow. Um, and I also, with this, want to take a moment to say thank you to all of the childcare providers who kept working throughout the past two and a half years that allowed me to work, to do some of this work, and that I would not be able to be here without a lot of people who went and operated childcare in some really adverse conditions. And so, so thank you. And to all the parents who um, persevered through all the chaos that's been going on. When we study snow, the first thing I really like to remind everyone is that you have to remember that my snow is different than your snow. And what do I mean when I say that is, um, is that snow varies vastly over the globe. And I grew up in California um, playing in the snow in the Sierra Nevada. Now I live in Washington. And um, after I won the Cryosphere Young Investigator Award, Matthew said, you need to come see my snow. You really have this biased version of snow. And here I am standing with Matthew on um, the ice sheet north of Utkiavik and looking out and all you see is flat and white as far as you can see. And it's, it's totally different than every kind of snow I ever thought about um, growing up. And if you, you look at the world map, um, and this is a, a paper from Sturm and Liston 2021, it's an update of the 1995 snow classification map they did. Um, all across, at least the Northern Hemisphere, there are a lot of different types of snow. And um, where I'm living in Washington, we have maritime snow, which is very deep, very wet. Where many of you are sitting in Saskatchewan, you have prairie snow, which is very windblown, very shallow. Um, what I just showed you the picture of was tundra snow and snow on ice. Um, we also have montane and boreal forest snow, which I won't be talking about today, but all of them are very, very different. I, I'm trying to have a broader perspective than I often have been digging my snow pit today, um, but even the globe is still too big for me. So I am going to zoom in to the Northern hemisphere, North America in particular. Um, again, I'm gonna be talking about Washington, Alaska, and Saskatchewan are labeled here, and all of the different snow types um, are also labeled spatially. And you can see, especially if you just do, you know, a transect going east from where I'm sitting in Seattle right now. Um, and can you see my um, can, you, can you see my pointer as I'm going through? That's good. Yes. All right, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> I just want to check. Sometimes that doesn't work on Zoom. All right, so as you move the transect east from Washington, you can see we we transect almost every kind of snow type there is. And and how does that affect the snow? And how does it affect the importance or role of our early season snow? Um, again, just thinking about that first shot of what we like to just dig in the snow. Um, when you dig in my snow versus you dig in Matthew's snow. <laughs> These are totally different digging experiences. Um, this is me with Johnston Barris at Snoqualmie Pass, where the Washington Department of Transportation has helped my class dig snow pit. And they often take out a, um, they actually like take out a bulldozer to bulldoze away the side of the snow on a hill so we can look at the whole stratigraphy without having to dig two or more meters down in the snow. And uh, in Alaska, there wasn't enough digging to keep me warm. I just needed more exercise. I was so cold up there. Um, when you dig in that snow, you see that the stratigraphy is really, really different as well. Um, here's the maritime snow, um, which has all these little popcorn looking things of like remelt crystals. It has ice lenses and percolation columns. This is what we're looking at in Washington. Up in the tundra, we have um, depth horror that we never see when we dig in the snow in Washington. And they're really different features. Um, but, you know, both these maritime and tundra snow and, you know, similar um, numbers can be had for the rest of them. Is there, there's a lot of water out there. There's a lot of area covered. Like, these are really important processes. Now, take a moment to look over this domain. And I'm hoping that at least the people who have access to the chat can maybe type a few reasons of why we care about early season snow. Why might snow 
early in the season, by early season, I'm thinking fall through the end of December, before January 1. What's coming up right now, we don't have much snow yet, but it's going to be the first snow we see. Why do we care particularly about early season snow? Does anyone have any ideas? And think about like where and why might it matter in different places on this map? And if you're in the room, you could talk to each other. Probably I can't hear you. <laughs> The ski season, absolutely, right? We make the most most money with that first December holiday. We can't wait. Albedo, like earlier, the sun's higher in the sky. Like we get snow really early in October. It's going to be more reflective. Any other ideas? People all checking their email. Wake up. The joys of online teaching. All right, I'll give, you, there we go, <laughs> flood moderation. Um, insulating the ground, absolutely. A more resilient seasonal snowpack, food sources covered, can't access to the ground, um, whether or not the soil freeze. I'll show you a few of my, these are all great. I'll show you a few of my, um, my motivations. Um, so what brought me to this problem was I'm working on a NASA interdisciplinary science no wildlife project with Laura Prue, who's pictured here on some very shallow Alaska snow in the Wrangell St. Alliance. And she was studying um, doll sheep, and here's a cute lamb, and found out that the lamb to you ratio, how well lambs have baby, baby ewes that survive the next year, was most predicted by fall snow depth. Spring didn't matter, winter didn't matter. It was really fall snow depth that was most predicting um, what happened to the sheep. So the fall seemed to matter more to them. I then um, started another project working with Rebecca Newman, who's a professor, two offices down for me at the University of Washington. And she's studying um, peat bogs near Fairbanks and methane emissions and permafrost thaw and all kinds of problems related to that. And she came to me and said, like, I need to know what's happening with the snow. And I think it's what's happening to the snow in the fall. And you have to figure out what's happening to the snow in the fall. And really what you can see here is in her low snow year, a normal snow year, is that in the normal snow year, um, the snow insulates the soil, as was remarked in the, in the chat. Um, and it, permafrost temperatures don't get quite so cold. But in a low snow year, where you have a really shallow soil, your permafrost temperatures get really, really cold. And this was summarized really nicely in a um, nice paper in the cryosphere in 2017 by Drew Slater, who um, first showed that, you know, snow becomes very insulating of soil temperatures above a depth of about 25 centimeters. So um, in that snow pit that, you know, Matthew was digging, this is a really important process of whether you get the snow deeper than 25 centimeters or not. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, it's not an issue, but it's also not that cold. Um, and he, Drew also showed in this paper that the effect of snow depth over the whole season, that the fall amounts, so that's the green line right here. So this is a snowpack that didn't get as deep as the other snowpack overall, that was deeper in the fall, ended up with the most effective insulation. Basically snow that falls earlier just has a longer season to insulate the snow. Um, we already mentioned the, um, the holiday skiing is really important to a lot of us. It also gives us a longer ski season. Um, over 20% of annual revenue in most places comes just from that one holiday. I was surprised. And also if the ski resorts can open earlier, you know, that's money they'd never recover. And this is obviously not a holiday weekend. This is COVID skiing, which was actually, I liked it, wasn't making a lot of people money. Um, spring snow observations greatly improve seasonal hydrologic forecasting in the Western US. And these hydrologic forecasts financially help hydropower, water utilities, commercial shipping, agriculture. And I also learned various investors in commodities and hedge funds who um, periodically ask me what I think the snow is going to do so they can make money. I haven't figured out how to make money myself. Um, this is a nice paper by Andrew Wood and um, Dennis Lettenmeyer. And they were trying to forecast stream flow in these different bases around, basins around the Western US. And you can see that there's a fair bit of air, you know, up to 60% positive or negative air on January 1st. But by March, just by incorporating the amount of snow into the forecast, the snow on the ground, that that air went much closer down to zero. They were actually greatly improve it by adding snow information. 
but, but such forecasting is not easy. Um, these are um, two graphics from a modeling paper by Ray Soon Kim et al. in 2021 in the cryosphere. And um, what you're looking on the um, left is mean SWE. Um, <laughs> note this is 200 plus that the coast range here just didn't really fall in the scale bar, as did Washington. We, we would have set the whole scale bar off by how much snow we have. Again, thinking about my scope is different than yours. But then if you do the coefficient of variation, which is your standard deviation divided by the mean, you can see that you know we have more than 50% variability over most of that seasonal snow zone. Um, there's a lot of variability and it's hard to forecast both in places with deep snow that matter for the water supply and in places with the shallow snow that really matter for um, the soils, the permafrost and the wildlife. And this variability you can see both in the mountains, here's the, um, the Cascades, the Coast Range of Sierra here and in the rain shadows, right? Um, downwind of them. Yeah, and thank you, Jeff, for defining SWE as you know, water equivalent. I think I did that two slides in and forgot. <laughs> um, so, so thinking about that paper I just showed you from um, Andrew and Dennis Lettenmeyer. So if you look on January 1st, the forecasts they were doing weren't any better than climatology. So the, the gray line is how well they could predict stream flow just based on climatology, saying this is how much stream flow usually is this time of year compared with all years they observed it. And the red and the blue were two different ways of um, incorporating snow and other information to improve it. Um, January 1st, they weren't doing any better, but by March 1st, when they had the snow information, um, they actually did a lot better. So one question, as I was wondering about the importance of fall snow, I was wondering, can we go earlier? Can we get to January 1st? And can we better predict peak snow from early snow, even snow conditions? And can we do this maybe at some times in some places? Can, can we maybe improve this, this forecast? And so um, early season, what can we predict for the rest of the water year? Where is that early season snow more important in terms of prediction? Um, starting with you know, climatology as a baseline to beat, we'll just guess the median, how much snow is already out there, how good do you do? Gives you an idea of interannual variability. Second, persistence, right? The, one of the reasons fall snow is so important is it's on the ground, it stays on the ground. If we look at how, what fraction of peak SWE has fallen by a certain date on average, can we better predict peak SWE based on seasonality? If all your snow falls earlier in the year, then um, you can predict the rest of the year. And then predictability, is there any kind of you know, statistical relationship or physical relationship between the amount of snow on the ground that will tell us whether we're going to get more or less snow in the future? Is the snow itself controlling something? So these are the um, questions that I'm going to work through. And um, how and why does this vary with different snow types and locations? Again, thinking about how different snow is. So let's start with climatology. So these are similar to graphs I've shown you before, but now I'm showing you the median. I'm showing the median because in my work, I'm trying to minimize the effect of outliers. A lot of snow data can be very bizarre in some years, and I want to minimize outliers in my first cut at doing this. Um, so what I'm going to be showing you, what I'm looking at are um, snow tell and British Columbia snow pillow observations. These are basically just like, think of a truck weight filled with antifreeze. It's a big platform in the ground that weighs the snow above it. It's just what's the weight of the water. Again, the SWE snow water equivalent, that's if you melt all of the snow, how much water do you get out of it? And then I'm gonna show you the output from these model runs by Ray and Kim. Um, that we call the soup model runs, which stands for the Snow Ensemble Uncertainty Project. It felt like we were just throwing a lot of things in the soup when we were running them. I am um, running a showing you particular output from um, 2009 to 2017 using uh, the NOAA MP model run by Meritu forcing. Um, if anyone has questions, I could tell you why. Otherwise, just think of it. It's a model. <laughs> it's an okay model. Uh, and you can see that, you know, basically the soup model runs capped the amount of snow in the mountains. I did not think the scale bars are quite different here. And our maritime snow really has a lot deeper snow than anywhere else. Um, and if we just presume that, you know, most years it gets about the median, how well do we do with prediction? 
to show you that in terms of a um, time series. So this is what's measured from a snow pillow. Um, this is SWE. Again, it tends to accumulate over the year through the fall, um, peaks sometime in the early spring and then melts out. Um, you, I want to highlight here the different scale bars. So the highest point of Granite Creek, Alaska is right here on Meadow Pass, Washington. Again, this very, very different snow. Um, so you can see this one, I've it expanded it. And um, what you see here, the black line is the median. And I'm showing you with the red arrows, the, the peak SWE. So what, the first question is, what is the mean absolute error in peak SWE over all the years? So here's all the years I have here. Um, compared to the median peak suite, what's your, your fractional error? So if you take um, that difference divided by the median, what, what percent are you off by? Um, what you really see is that um, the mean absolute error, which is a representation here in interannual variability, because we're just comparing to the mean, it increases to the south and increases along the coastline. Actually, British Columbia is not doing too bad, 20%. Not, nearly as variable. I grew up in California where you never have any idea what snow is going to be next year. Um, and, you know, that's quite more variability down here than up here. I also think there still may be a few odd yellow spots may just be a really bad measurement that I haven't yet filtered out. As I mentioned, this is preliminary, preliminary results. Um, so, so that's our baseline. Can we beat it? So what more can you learn? by looking at the snow water equivalent on um, December 1st, which is shown right here, and then on January 1st. So I've highlighted these vertical dashed lines are um, December 1st. And what I'm showing you, this is the same plot I showed you before, is just the snow water equivalent. And then this is the fraction of the water year peak suite. How much have you accumulated in terms of the total by that date? And so you can see here in Granite Creek, but by December 1st, we've accumulated, you know, 30 to 40 percent um, at Meadow Pass, Washington, only like 10 to 20 percent. Um, and so first, let's look at that with the model data, which looks much prettier because it's continuous. So what we're going to do is take the median SWE on December 1st, divide it by the median peak annual SWE. So what, what fraction do you have? And so what you can see here is probably what you would expect that you have a greater fraction of your total snow water equivalent on the ground further north, right? It's colder there. Also, storm tracks are moving um, from the north to the south through the season. So um, you've got more moisture up there and it's colder, so it's sticking as snow. It's not rain. Um, by the time you get down here in California, only almost nothing, it's just too warm for snow to stick at that time of year. Um, we can repeat this with the snow tell and British Columbia snow observations. And they also have temperature measurements. So you can look at the ratio um, of the median December 1 SWE to peak SWE compared to temperature and really see it's very strongly a function of colder sites have much more early season snow than warmer sites. Now, does this change at all if we move to um, January 1st? So now, um, you see that, that in Alaska, um, at this Granite Creek site, about 50% of the snow is accumulated by January 1st. And we've got about 40%. So we have a lot more snow on the ground by January 1st, typically, than by December 1st. This is pretty much a big, December is a good snow month most places. And now some more interesting patterns observed. It's no longer just a north-south gradient. So here's median SWE on so January 1st, median peak annual SWE. Here's our fraction. And now I have a very important question for everyone in the audience. Is it true that almost all the snow in Saskatchewan falls before the 1st of January? And um, if all the people in Saskatchewan are in the room, someone might have to unmute and, and tell me because this is like about no. OK. <laughs> is it true that like more than half? <laughs> Lots of no's. OK, so the model thinks something's going on that's probably not right. All right, so we need some observations because I couldn't find any snow till out there. It just feels like it. <laughs> all right, so I'm guessing it's not all. Anybody going to give me a guess? What would you say is a better number? Is it going to be 50%, 70%? How much snow is on the ground? I 
So John says there's a spring maximum in snowfall in the prairies of the Rockies, 25%. All right, so we're gonna go find out what's up with this one. All right, thank you. <laughs> That's why I need feedback. All right, so something's going on where we think that all the snow falls before January. This model doesn't blow snow around, so I don't know, it's not actually blowing it away. And that's why I need feedback. So we see pattern. So I didn't have validation for Saskatchewan, but you'll notice that this area and this area here are both inland of mountains. So we're seeing something, at least it's model simulations that are inland of mountain. And I was able to check this area and you can actually see at the snow kill site that there is a similar pattern to what the model is getting is that the interior locations are getting a higher percentage not all like it said was happening in Saskatchewan but um but definitely like you know sites ranging from like 40 to 60 percent at various sites in here they're getting more snow early in the season in the interior than you get along the coastal ranges and even on the eastern bound of the Rockies. Comparing these with temperature, you can see there still is a slope of um, median January sweep, peak sweep versus temperature. Um, as it gets warmer, it goes down slightly up to zero. And then for the warmest sites, drops off quite a bit. But even by January 1, the warmest sites get more snow later in the year. All right. Okay, so let's see if we get any better prediction if we use this ratio. If we say we know we get half of our snow by this date, which we did in um, a lot of the Alaska sites. Um, and we take this here uh, for the Washington site. So if each year we say, okay, we think we've got 40%. Now we'll take the amount this year. We'll presume we have 40% on the ground. Take the number divided by 40%. Let's make a prediction of peak sweep. How does that do? And how does that compare to just guessing the median? Do we do any better? Do we do worse? Um, similar pattern to before, the air increases to the south and the coastline. And um, again, we have some sites that look like they might have problems, um, but which method is better? So this is comparing the mean absolute air um, where the size of the triangle is telling you um, the size of the, the difference between the two methods. The blue is showing you that you get smaller error by predicting the median. If you want to know, you're better off guessing the median than trying to use a ratio. The reds are showing you that you get a better number by using the ratio. And the interesting thing in terms of my snow is different than your snow is there's actually a pretty clear dividing line pretty close to the US Canadian border, right? If you go further north, if you're in Alaska um, or in the Canadian, um, British Columbia snow tell region, it's actually that ratio method helps. These are areas that get more snow earlier in the year, have more snow on the ground that using that information is valuable. As you go further south, if you're in California, Arizona, it's a really bad idea. You have a scattering of snow on the ground. It has nothing to do with the amount of snow that's happening in the rest of the year. You're better off guessing the median from some <laughs> earlier average. Um, there's also some, some interesting patterns across the mountain ranges that you can actually see that the interior locations sometimes again the cold interior you do improve by um, the ratio method in um, pockets all right so predictability um, could we actually look at snow on the ground and just for the simplest first cut do a regression analysis so here are three different snow tail sites in Alaska, Washington, and Wyoming. The top is just traces of snow water equivalent. Um, the next line is if you measure SWE on January 1st and then look at peak SWE that year, um, we would hope it would generally be above a one-to-one -one line, right? More snow is gonna happen. Um, so there should be some just by snow persisting um, capability, but is that change right here from that one-to-one -one line the additional SWE you get, is that in any way related to the amount of snow on the ground on January 1st? Um, and so here you see the change in SWE, the additional snow that accumulates on the ground from January 1st to peak SWE, one-to-one -one lines. Um, and these all happen to be three that are correlated that I'm showing you 
There are plenty more that look like shotgun blasts. All right. So, um, so the question is first, are these correlated? Um, and if the answer to that is yes, then can we do um, linear regression provide a better prediction? Um, we would hope so, but how much is it worth trying? Um, so here are sites across the network where only those with a coral with a um, significance level p value less than 0.1 are shown. Um, these are correlation coefficients. They are not squared. They're just R values, so they are not huge. Um, but I'm only going to look at these. If there is no correlation, we presume it's a bad idea to start with. So looking just at these patients, can we do better with prediction? Um, so the, the larger map is just, so because I picked the correlated sites, they all, regression gives more information, they all did at least slightly better. So all the arrows are down, they're a reduction in the mean absolute error. Um, the larger one, um, the, the larger map here is showing the comparison with just picking the median. How much better do you do the median if you form that regression I showed you? And the inset here is how much better do you do versus the ratio method. So, um, so by the setup of the question, the regression always does better than the median. Um, the improvements are actually largest at Pacific Northwest maritime sites. And it turns out the interior sites actually um, do equally well with the ratio method. Those that had a correlation just using the ratio for any year um, was, was better. Whoops. Um, the sites that we had problems with had really bad air values in California and Arizona had no correlation to start with, so we didn't get any help with this whatsoever there. Um, what was most surprising to me actually was that we got, um, we got some improvement along the cascade at fairly warm sites, but to me, it was not intuitive. We didn't have a whole lot of snow on the ground at these sites by January 1, it wasn't a large fraction, um, but there was a regression that helped. So why? Um, and this is a picture from the coast range flying in between Washington and Alaska. And, um, and so here we're going to um, add in, we're asking why, so the first question is, are fall and winter precipitation um, correlated? And you can see that for the Alaska site and the Wyoming site, they are. They are. There's a significant correlation with precipitation in the fall and the winter. So if you're set up, the reason regression works, if you're set up to get more snowfall in the fall, I know that's a bad way to word it, you also get um, more snowfall for the rest of the year. And um, here you can see on the left, are maps of um, just Alaska and the lower 48. I didn't have precipitation measurements for the BC network. Um, so downward arrows mean precipitation is anti-correlated. You see this up on the North Slope and um, at the few sites in um, Washington and Oregon. And the upward arrows are um, positively correlated with um, these colors showing the R value. Over on the right is the same one I showed you before, the correlation map of the um, snow, January 1 snow with peak snow. And so you can see that the interior locations are well explained by the precipitation, but the coastal locations are not. So if we go and look at our Washington coastal location, you see that the precipitation scatter plot does not look correlated at all. It kind of looks like a shotgun blast. Um, so fall and winter precipitation are not correlated. However, in these coastal sites, precipitation falls as a mix of rain and snow. So if you look at this picture of just what's happening to snow over the year compared to the other sites, you can see that there are some here where snow just dies, um, dies in January, dies in February, and it just never recovers. Your peak sweet doesn't get high. But what happens is that a very low early season snowpack is more subject to midwinter melt. It's also more subject to rain on snow going somewhere else and not being retained in the snowpack. So in terms of your water equivalent, you lose it. So in these warmer sites, how, um, and the vice versa is also true. If you have a really deep snowpack, it has more cold contact and absorb water. It takes 
more heat to start it melting. And so it has more resistance to midwinter melt. And so this early season snow is really important to the persistence of snow throughout the year in these coastal sites. All right, so. So our summary so far, um, colder and more northern locations have a greater fraction of peak SWE early in the season, and hence they have predictability by persistence. They've got more of their total snowpack. Um, some of these sites also have correlated fall and winter precipitation patterns due to large scale circulation, which also lets them, um, which also provides predictability. At many warmer and maritime locations, High or low early season snow water equivalent determines the likelihood of midwinter melt, which affects peak SWE. As temperatures warm, the midwinter melt predictability may become more important at more locations. However, this is a big maybe because our southernmost locations, such as California, really had very little predictability at all. That the precip variability was so much larger that just the likelihood of snow to stick around did not provide any indication about peak SWE. So, um, I have a little bit more in terms of time. I think we're doing okay. Um, this is my check-in, see if there's any questions so far. Looks like John is going to explain some of the spring accumulation here. Um, so, why do we see these patterns? So, the, the first pattern we really saw was you know, more early season snow to the north, moving south. And this is this is a pretty well documented phenomenon. We know the Eastern Pacific storm tracks migrate south between the months of September and January. So this is a graph um, from Hoskins et al, 2019 paper, and he's tracking um, 850 hectopascal peak storm intensity. So basically where, where are the storms at what latitude? And what you see is, um, this is 55 north, October, November, December, they're moving down. January, February, they've really jumped quite a bit further down. Um, so Alaska storms are really peaking in September, October. California storms are peaking in January, February, with just the storm track moving down um, in between from moisture from the Pacific. Similarly, um, atmospheric rivers are also migrating down in the same pattern. So this is. Um, the, the June up at the top, the June, July, August pattern. You can see that that summer Alaska is getting wet and it's very dry in Washington. Um, but by December, January, February, it is raining every day in Washington and it is not raining in Alaska. Um, you can also see right here in this graph just the number of atmospheric rivers coming through the um, right here. The green line is southwest Alaska is peaking um, in. Uh, September-ish period, uh, British Columbia is peaking October, November period. Um, US West Coast is peaking um, November, December, January with California being on the later side of that. When you think about the specific moisture and uh, apologies to everyone from the Eastern half of the continent. Um, as I was honest, I spent the most of my time on the very Western edge, so I just know it better. And this is where you can give me feedback um in a few minutes um but from storms coming from the west you can see that as these storm tracks move south they get to the inland locations through few preferential pathways through the mountains so if you noticed i highlighted all here where the mountain major mountain ranges are along the western half of the um, north america here and they're also you can see the mountain ranges here and I, I told you at the beginning, I'm obsessed with mountains. So I can't give a talk without saying that mountains are really the reason for everything. So, um, whoops, let's go back. Back again, sorry. All right, so these interior, should be so with an I, not a U, penetrating atmospheric rivers, they get here through, um, right here is the Columbia River Gorge, is a gap in the mountains. The north end of Sierra is a gap in the mountain. This area that's highlighted in yellow here that also has showed up in the snow pillow locations um, gets less snow overall, but of that snow, they get more in the fall. That 
really looking at the atmospheric river literature, they're much more energetic at that time. The storm intensity, as you can see from this plot, the storm intensity is generally higher earlier in the season, and it's able to get in further. Also, the um, upper air storm intensity, which is what causes that interior propagation, is stronger earlier in the season. So we actually get more of our total snowfall in rain shadow locations earlier in the season. Um, in my attempts to try to figure out what's going on in your neck of the woods, and I look forward to more thoughts on this, um, I found this paper, which were flow pathways for moisture in the Mackenzie and the Saskatchewan River Basin. And they also highlighted that there are two gaps in um, the coast range and the mountains in British Columbia here, Channel 1 and Channel 2, and that primarily the storms go through these two gaps, which would get more storms earlier in the season as the um, moisture ships from north to south. Another way to think about it is just the total number of storms. This is a paper by Shang Nong et al. in 2006, and he's plotting the average annual number of snowstorms for 1901 to 2001. And you can see that a lot of these interior locations that said they got a large fraction of their snowfall early, you know, really only get, you know, one to two to three snowstorms a year. Whereas in the Pacific Northwest, you know, we're getting 30 snowstorms a year all along these, these mountain ranges. We're getting quite a bit. The storms keep coming, so you have a less fraction of the total. It keeps coming all year round. All right, so in summary, um, coastal mountains get many more storms total. The interior only gets moisture that passes through mountain gaps, at least for this part where we have observational data. The moisture passage is more likely with more energetic storms of November and December. And maybe, and I'll read whatever John wrote in the chat in a minute, um, Saskatchewan region needs energetic storms far enough north. Is that always in December? Uh, and with that, um, I will stop talking. Um, this is a picture from doing our wildlife field work in Alaska um, from this spring. Thank you to NASA for funding. Thank you to my mountain hydrology research group for listening to uh, earlier versions of these graphs. Here's, thank you, any questions, any advice? I put a map of Saskatchewan here. This area, you have to explain the weather to me because I have not spent all that time there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was really an outstanding talk. And, you know, we're, we're going to manage for the first time uh, questions both live in the audience in Saskatoon and online. Kim, maybe maybe I could look to you just to see uh, if there are any in-person questions. I know we have a mic set up in the room and that might be helpful for those uh, online to be able to hear the question. Um, if there are any questions live now, we could go for that. Otherwise, people could unmute themselves and uh, ask a question. You can hear me, Jeff. Think. I'm yeah. in the room here. Mm -hmm. So put up your hand if you've got a question in here. Great. Maybe just while we're waiting, Jessica, I was wondering about, you know, combining uh, some of what you said with remote sensing products to help sharpen things. So the, the kind of, uh, you know, going back and forth between snow teller supplementing with with uh, remote sensing and how that's come into uh, prediction, both, you know, April 1, but some of these other measures you were talking about. I mean, right now, I mean, we are funded by NASA, so we obviously are looking at remote sensing um, as our job. <laughs> I showed you nothing for remote sensing in this whole talk. Um, it, you can, the remote sensing is interesting that fall people have tried to say like, when is the onset of fall, right? We're really good at snow presence, absence detection at all kinds of different scales with remote sensing. We don't currently have a remote sensing product that reliably gives you sweet, the amount yeah. of snow water equivalent on the ground. And we're working on that on a lot of different fronts, but we don't have it right now. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing about these Northern snowpacks is that in the fall, they get snow covered, you see white, but how deep is it? And it's that depth that's actually really affecting the permafrost and the wildlife. And that part we are not yet getting from remote sensing. Yeah. It's also why it's hard to evaluate what the model is saying in those regions. Um, 
yes. it, it's it's a challenge right now. Um, Good, thank you. I see John has his hand up. Over to you, John. Oh, hi, uh, Jessica. Thank you. I really enjoyed the talk, and uh, it, 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 was, it was wonderful. It's an interesting thing. The whole fall snowfall build up and. Uh, <laughs> I agree, tremendously important and as continental scale feedbacks on the persistence of snow cover uh, that people have shown uh, partial Groisman. But I, I'm also thinking the fall precip is important for secondary peaks and stream flow. And uh, some people have uh, seen trends in that where uh, those false peaks and stream flow are getting larger. So I presume more of this fall precips falling as rain instead of as snow over the Western mountains. That was some work that Paul Whitfield and Kevin Chook did. But the, um, I, I guess my question is, have you seen trends in any of this data or shifts in the patterns that you're seeing? Have you been, have you looked long enough? Do you have a long enough database to start to see any shifts in this as well? I was, yeah, we were really trying to figure out yeah, climate implications and shifts. You see quite strongly, if you just do a regression against temperature, you get fall and spring temperature correlated because actually both are going up. <laughs> There's trends mm -hmm. that they're both going up, um, fall, winter, and all the temperatures are going up. So they're all correlated from that standpoint. Um, the, the likelihood of midwinter winter melt is going up in a lot of places. The trends are quite confusing. Um, and I've looked at them and read a quite bit, a fair bit, and I have not yet really found a, tr a trend beyond temperatures are going up and what you would think obvious. Spring snow melt is coming earlier, spring snow is disappearing earlier. But fall is kind of, in terms of finding snow and where it is, kind of all over and it's pretty local. I mean, we're definitely seeing a lot of big fall rainstorms here. We do have two peaks, but we also have seen them quite a bit over the instrumental record. Um, I did look a fair bit at cyclicity. So um, there's actually a lot of the a lot of the actually precip patterns are tied to the PDO, the Pacific, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which in the time I didn't want to go into. Um, but that is um, that actually looks more explanatory than a trend in terms of precip right now. It's more the ocean states. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. And all I can say about Saskatchewan snow is. Uh, it's a it's a devil of a thing. Um, the uh, <laughs> the uh, the sources of precip are sometimes up from the south as well, and uh, because uh, the prairies are so cold that a yeah. warm winter can often mean a wetter winter and snowier right. winter, um, and it's the colder periods that are the driest. So it's so temperature correlations. You know, when it's minus thirty, if it warms up to minus twenty, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, it's, um, <laughs> it, uh, or it, it, in terms of, uh, but but the uh, generally the uh, uh, advection of uh, water vapor into the area will be cloud cover, and those are warmer periods for sure. So, right. uh, so some of our snowiest winters have been the warmest, um, right? So far, yeah, that would make sense. Okay, I'm just looking around for uh, hands up electronically or in the room? Oh, I think I see one into the chat. Do you want to take that, Jessica, or would you like me to read it to you? I can read it. Um, Magali, I hope I pronounced your name right, says, thank you. I wonder how the snow in the fall trends relate to vegetation type on the ground. Can you comment on that? Thank you. So I've, I've actually had people ask me that question before. The data set I have, the snow tell, if you go and look at them, they tend to be in gaps in forests. <laughs> For the observation bar, the nice like gap that doesn't have forest above it, but has forest block the wind around it. That's what all the observations were for. The model does have vegetation in it, but I don't trust how the model handles the vegetation. So I wouldn't believe that it's explaining it. Um, we, I do think that the vegetation on the ground is telling you about the climate. It's growing where it's growing because of the climate. And so at this map that I have on my screen right now, it's actually really you know, interesting. You see those snow types I showed you, the mountain types, the prairie types, like the vegetation is telling you about the snow even in the summer because it grows there because the snow is like that. And I think there are certain vegetation types that really need fall snow to keep them insulated all winter and they are growing where there's enough fall snow. Um, whether the vegetation affecting fall snow, I don't know. There's some nice work on the tundra about, you know, feedback of accumulating the snow and then melting the snow, but I don't think people have looked at that in the fall 
to my knowledge. I think it's mostly been spring. Thank you. <clears throat> Any of our 990 students, our master's water security students, please, uh, please go ahead and ask a question if you have them or Kim in the room, let me know. Well, it looks like Hannah might have a question online that maybe went to someone directly, but Hannah, I don't know if you can unmute and just ask your question. Uh, no, I didn't have a question. I was just giving you feedback that I heard you okay um, <laughs> on your microphone. <laughs> Jessica, one thing that struck me listening to uh, forecasters at the Oregon Department of Agriculture, you, you mentioned Pacific Decadal Oscillation. What they've been doing is looking at La Nina uh, years from years past and giving three months forecasts. And they kind of watch which La Nina years going back I don't know, 75 years or so are tracking like our La Nina years, right? Or, or our La Nina this, this year and last year. And it looks like we're going into a third La Nina cycle perhaps. And it's just shocking how good they've been with their three month out forecast. <laughs> and I wonder how that might factor into some of the work you're doing on the snow front. Uh, of course, they're motivated by just water availability for irrigation or my interest is uh, sailing in some of the lakes and reservoirs <laughs> in Oregon. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? You know, I, I looked at both the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and El Nino, and I was correlating better with the PDO for the patterns I was looking at. Um, my reading on the topic, and I'm not, not an expert at all, um, is that like the El Nino forecast seemed to be secondary to certain states of the PDO, that when the PDO is in certain states, El Nino works really well. And when the PDO shifts, that suddenly you're, there's, they seem to, you need to use them in concert, that both of them together seem to have information. Um, that, for example, like the, the 2015 drought across, you know, Western US that was so, you know, that was in my Washington, that was the one where the snow just was gone super early. Um, that you could not, you couldn't forecast that one with El Nino. That seemed to be a larger scale pattern going on. So I think there is information content there, and I'm I'm really happy to hear they're doing they're doing really well. Um, and they do you know if they also have? I mean, are, are they doing multiple regression? Because I'm finding those are actually doing pretty good. Yeah, and I can. I'll, I'll follow up with an email and and send you what I receive from them. Yeah, I can actually yeah. show you. Um, that if we go, this is um, if you just regress against you PDO. You need to screen, I think. We oh can't yeah, see your never screen. mind. Yep. Um, I, I won't even bother sharing this. I'll just tell you um, is that when I was showing you before the sites that had um, the January one sway on the ground regression, the ones that had precip correlation, you could develop a regression equation against the December state of the PDO, and you did. You did as well as a sweet on the ground prediction for those correlated precip. The correlated precip actually seemed to be set up by Pacific Ocean temperature patterns. Okay. Um, so that, that was interesting. Excellent. Other comments, questions? John's just unmuted, so I. Well, just just on the uh, on the PDO ENSO correlations, we've been looking for them with snowpack um, on the eastern slopes of the Rockies. So it's the headwaters of the Saskatchewan River system and then out in the prairies as well. And so far, um, we've never found any to be significant. Uh, I didn't see anything in that region at yeah. all. So th it was Wyoming, probably... like the best predictability is in Wyoming. For Wyoming, of course, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know why. <laughs> that I'm yeah, still yeah. reading the literature. I don't know why. <laughs> But it's uh, it's 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 strange because we think, well, we, you know, it, it should be impacting at least the Rockies. But the uh, I guess other factors are in there and overwhelming that from what we can see, uh, at least for peak SWE in the spring. Yeah, it, there's there's also no no fall spring sweet correlation in that region either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we did some uh, Kevin Chuck and I did some analysis for, to help Alberta environment with its predictability and. They do snow surveys starting January 1st and February 1st, March mm -hmm. 1st. And the early snow surveys just weren't helpful at all with their spring yeah. uh, water supply predictions. It, again, because of that spring set, yeah. spring maximum in precip. It's, mm -hmm. 
I mean, at California, there was no predictability. Also, if you read seasonal predictability papers, everyone in the lower 48 says California is impossible. Uh, <laughs> it's because you get a, in California growing up, we called it, we get a March miracle or an amazing April or <laughs> May miracle. <laughs> All your snow suddenly falls in some month that you have no idea it's coming in. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's what keeps people like you, like you and John in business, huh? <laughs> or, or excited, right? <laughs> Something to wonder about. <laughs> don't want to answer too many questions. Yeah. Jessica, I see a comment by Ching. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I Ching know. wants to know if I took account of blowing snow in the model. Absolutely not. There's no blowing snow yeah. in this model. Um, some of my other students are working on things related to blowing snow, but what I showed you today knew nothing about blowing snow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're getting close to the end of our time. Just looking around the room, Kim or online, anyone with Anybody a final comment here? or question? All right. Well, Jessica, this was really a, a lovely hour. Thank you so much. Uh, really interesting material and uh, such relevance, of course, to what folks are doing at the University of Saskatchewan and beyond. So thanks so much for your time on behalf of everyone. Uh, we're, we're having a round of applause. <laughs> um, and then again, for everyone, don't forget that we're doing now a early career session. It'll be very informal. Uh, it's with uh, Jessica who will join us. I'll, I'll just be the moderator. We're gonna do it live in the Global Institute for Water Security conference room. So if you'd like to uh, move there now, if you're in the live audience, and if you're coming in by Zoom or other, uh, uh, coming in by Zoom on this call, look at the chat because the first uh, in line in the chat is the Zoom address for this next uh, session. It's a separate Zoom address for the early career. And we will uh, resume there in about five minutes. So Jessica, thanks so much. And we'll see you shortly on the other Zoom address.